Uh, last week we took up one of the most iconic scenes in all of scriptures. Uh, you, you know this from the movies and you know this from seeing cartoons. and you know It's been discussed over and over again by even non-Christians. And that scene is about the burning, the burning bush. Okay? When God called Moses through the burning bush. Uh, and we focused our attention last week on God's call rather than the actual burning bush. A lot of, uh, I, see, I heard a lot of sermons on this. And the focus was on the burning bush, which is not bad. Uh, because the burning bush does signify some things about God. It tells us about the characteristics of God. But I think for us, uh, I think the call of God is uh, more relevant uh, because that's who we are as people, as Christians, right? We are called out by God. That's why our focus last week was on the call rather than the burning bush. Uh, and I said last week that God's call is almost always unexpected, okay? Okay. Uh, God's call will almost always, or actually will always get your attention, and it will not fail to get your attention. Uh, and thirdly, I said that God's call cannot be taken lightly because of two reasons. One, because of the one who calls, and the seriousness or the severity of the call, which is always uh, deals with life and death situations. Okay? That's what I said last week about God's call. Okay? Unexpected, it's going to get your attention, it deals with life and death situations, and it is God who is calling you. <laughs> That's why we should take it seriously. Right? And then we proceeded to discuss uh, different ways that God calls us today. Right? I said that even though, you know, when you go to your rooms, when you go home this, this uh, afternoon, there's no burning bush in your living room, or you're not going to be walking around the street and all of a sudden see a burning bush, God still calls us today. Okay? He's still going to get our attention today, but in different ways. Okay? I like the ways back in the old days, okay? because God's call in the old days was cool, like oh, burning bush angels coming to your, right, to your room and God talking to you straight from a, from a bush. That's amazing. You don't see that anymore. I like those better, but he doesn't do that anymore. God doesn't do it anymore. Uh, in our times, God usually um, just calls us in the ways that we are used to. The, okay, the normal ways that God calls us uh, nowadays in 2021. Um, and I said this last week, I'm going to say it again. Uh, that, that list that I shared with you last week is not all-encompassing uh, as far as God's ways of calling us today is. Okay? It doesn't contain all the ways that God can call us today. God can call you... You know, in many different ways, many more different ways than the ones I shared with you last week. In fact, he can call you any way he wants. Uh, I mentioned dreams. Sometimes God calls you through dreams. Um, I didn't want to focus on that last week because some people take that to the extreme uh, and say that all their dreams is about uh, God. God called me, uh, or God called you through uh, calls you through uh, different things. Now, some people. Uh, they, they go to the extreme and, do, uh, and they make it uh, superstitious. Like, you know, uh, oh, look, uh, the numbers on the fortune cookies. It equals my birthday and my kid's birthday. and my, That means God is calling me to what? Buy lotto. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> we shouldn't take it as that. Okay, or, or the parking lot uh, nearest to the... To the exit is, is open, I should take it. No, that's not, we, it's not about superstition when it comes to God's call. That's why I shared with you last week uh, the more common ways uh, that God calls us. Uh, namely, through Scripture, okay, if you remember this from last week, through Scripture, through His Son, through the Lord Jesus Christ, by way of the Gospel. That's how He calls us. Uh, through other believers or other people. Uh, through music. Uh, through good and bad circumstances. Okay, I think a lot of people kind of related to that. Good and bad circumstances. Uh, through His Holy Spirit and through prayer. Uh, those are the ways that, uh, common ways that God calls us nowadays. Uh, the last two, the Holy Spirit and prayer, uh, are not just ways that God calls us, but also are ways that God uses to help us determine or discern if that call is from God or it's not. 
He uses the Holy Spirit to give us that discernment and prayer uh, to determine whether the call that we're hearing is from God or is it just us? Uh, or is it from the other side? <laughs> is it from the devil? Uh, so God uses those two to help us discern uh, what, what call is from his, what call is true, and what call is not. So the Holy Spirit in us and prayer uh, is God's gifts, God's graces to us to help us determine if a call is from him or not. So, uh, so far what we've learned uh, from the life of Moses is a more, uh, in a more general sense, is that uh, from the time we are born, God has already, already has a purpose for us, right? That's what we saw in Moses' life starting in chapter from the time Moses was born, God already had a purpose for, for him. And so it's the same thing for us. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I think I said this in the first two sermons on Exodus. Uh, God created us just for that purpose. you believe that? That God created you for a certain purpose? Um, I think it was John Piper that took that to the next level. And he said, and he said that you're not going to die until that purpose is accomplished. you believe that? Who believe that? Because <laughs> I believe that, right? I believe that. The Apostle Paul, you know how many times he got away from, from death, right? Why? Because his purpose was not done yet. Um, Jesus, Jesus, uh, he escaped death a few times um, until his purpose was, was done, right? I think the same for us. If your purpose is, whatever your purpose is, uh, the, 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 I guess the trick is to know what your purpose is. Uh, ask God for that. What is my purpose? And then do it. Uh, and while you're doing your purpose, well, God will protect you and He will help you accomplish your, your purpose. Uh, even to the point of protecting you from death. You're not done yet. Uh, but once, once you're done, yeah, God will take you home. Okay? So, I, I mean, I believe that. Um, and I think Moses, for Moses, is the same thing. If you know the whole life of Moses, it's, that's the same thing. He accomplishes purpose. And then coming into the promised land in, in, in Deuteronomy, uh, what happened? He never got in uh, because that wasn't his purpose. His purpose was to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And then it was Joshua's turn to take them into the, the promised land. Uh, I think that's the same for us. And that's, uh, but that's what's happening, right, in Moses' life. God created him for a purpose, and God uses time and circumstances in order to prepare us for that purpose. Uh, for Moses, uh, his Egyptian education, his upbringing was used by God as preparation. Okay? When Moses murdered the Egyptian, that was used by God as preparation so that Moses will accomplish his purpose. Right? He sent him to Midian to, to learn and to, to grow as a man and be mature as a leader. Um, and then, through testing and serving and through family and other relationships, God prepared Moses while spending the 40 years in the desert. That's how God prepares people. Right? That's, that's how what we've been learning so far. Right? So God uses the same formula in order to prepare us to live out our purposes in Him. And He uses the burning bushes of 2021 to call us, to call to us. Okay? So now, question is, how do you respond? If God is using this right now, the scriptures, music, other people, circumstances, if he's using all that to call you to accomplish his purpose in your life, the question is, how do we respond? That's the, going to be the focus of this morning's message. We will take a look at how Moses responded to God's call. And then from there, we're going to take some lessons that we can learn. Uh, from the response of Moses, okay? So we already know where we're going. Uh, it's just, how do we get there, <laughs> okay? So what was Moses' response after God called him through the burning bush? First, in verse 11. Can you guys read that, verse 11? Hey, so Moses said, who am I? Like, he forgot who he was? Is that what that is? Who am I? Oh, in Tagalog, 
Sino ba naman ako? <laughs> right? Is that right translation? Who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Who am I? But before we examine that, let's let's go back a few verses, okay? This uh, these verses is when Moses first heard the call of God through the burning bush. Okay, what did Moses say then? Check out uh, three two. Let's go back all the way to chapter to verse two of chapter three. The angel of the Lord appeared to him, appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Moses, he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And in three, and Moses said, what? I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned, right? And then in four, when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God, what? Called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses. And he said, what? Here. His first response when God called him was, I'm here. He's excited. Here I am. Like, just like when Isaiah uh, saw that vision. Remember that, that vision in Isaiah uh, of the throne and, and, and God sitting on the throne. And God says, who will go for me? What, is, what was Isaiah's response? Here I am. Send me. Same thing, right? Moses, same thing. He was excited. Here I am, volunteering, even taking off his sandals afterwards and bowing as if, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the form of a servant. Right? He was excited to go. Right? He was excited to go. Now, what happened after that? Okay. What happened after that? He found out what God wanted him to do. They go to, go to Egypt, speak to Pharaoh, and tell him to let my people go. After that, what happened? What did he say? <laughs> Whoa, who am I? No more here I am. Now it's, who am I? He forgot who he was. All of a sudden, the confidence that he had the first time God called vanished. What happened? Um, let me read you a comment by Reichen, uh, and I quote, uh, but of course this was all before Moses actually knew what God wanted him to do. The, the, his response in verses 2 and 4 of chapter 3. And as soon as he found out, he started to have his doubts. Apparently Moses was the kind of man who said yes first and asked questions later. He had five questions in all, Though by the time the conversation was finished, they were more like objections rather than questions. So when, Mo when God first called Moses, he was so confident. I, I, whatever, Lord, I am here. And then when God said, okay, this is what I want you to do. And then all of a sudden Moses is like, mm -hmm, no, who am I? Right? I can definitely relate to this, okay? I can definitely Relate because there are some people, and I know because I'm one of them, who talk a big game when it comes to changing the church. Let's let's let's, let's do some reforms in the church. This is not right about the church. Okay, this should not be that. This should be this. The seats should not be the the way it is. The worship service should be changed. All this stuff should be changed in the church. They can talk all that stuff, right? I was like that. Okay, when I was with the young people. I see a lot of things wrong with the church and the leadership of the church and how, you know what, uh, this church should be, you know, we shouldn't be electing our elders and we shouldn't be doing this and we should be making all these changes. But when God said, okay, you want to do that? Okay, come, be the pastor. What was my first reaction? <laughs> no, <laughs> who am I? <laughs> who am I to lead? Who am I to, but you are talking such a big game. And there are a lot of people like that now in our church, right? I'm sure there are a lot of people sitting out there, oh, the pastor should be doing this, he should be doing this, the leader should be doing this and this and that. When you ask them to do it, what do they say? Not me. Who am I? <laughs> Some of you are laughing. But it's true, right? Every time there, we, there's people like that, right? They talk so much about wanting to do certain things, but when it's time for them to do it, all of the talk, all of the confidence goes away. 
all of a sudden they realize, oh, maybe it's not that easy after all. I was the same. When I was in the youth coordinator, again, when I was the youth coordinator of this church, I had so many observations, so many comments on, you know, uh, what church leadership should look like and what changes need to be made in our church. And, uh, you know, criticizing leaders. Well, why are they doing this? And what are they doing? But when that call actually came, I shrunk back. I didn't want... I was, just, I was just saying my opinions, God. I didn't really want to do that. <laughs> Be careful. No, if that's, no, seriously, if that's you, if you're the armchair pastor or the backseat back seat deacon or backseat elder, be careful. Because God might say, oh, really? <laughs> you, want, you want to make changes? Okay, let me call you. See what, you, see what you're going to do. Be careful. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, um, you know, be worried about things that are not right with the church. Yes, you should. But don't make it to a point where, you know, you sound like you're going to do something about it. And then when God calls you, <laughs> that's what happened to Moses, right? Here I am, Lord. Okay, this is what I want you to do. Talk to Pharaoh. Oh, no, Lord, that's not me. That's what happened to me. I shrunk back. Right? And what, what made me shrink back? Because when I thought about the things that I said and the changes that I wanted to make, and I look at my own abilities, my skills, my gifts, so quote unquote, I asked myself, was I good enough to make these things happen? And I'm like, no, I'm not. So what, what, what was it that kind of gave me doubts? It was that focus on myself. A focus on myself and what I can do and not do is what brought doubts and questions within. Right? Moses doing the same here. Right? From excitement and the posture of a servant to fear and doubt, he asks himself, who am I? Or he asks God, who am I that I should be doing this? How can someone like me face the ruler of the known world back then in Pharaoh and tell that person to let my people go? How can someone like me do that? All of a sudden, Moses is thinking to himself, I'm nobody. Right? As far as Moses is concerned, he's probably thinking, I'm just a shepherd. I have no armies. I have no right to be in this conversation. And if you revert back to my example, as far as I was concerned, I was thinking, I have no leadership abilities. I wasn't even doing a good job with the young people. Now you want me to lead the whole church? No, I can't do it. Right? I know I see that, I, I, I know that I see that we as a church back then needed a lot of changes, but get somebody else to do it. I can't do it. Right? That was my mentality back, back then. Now, looking back, um, looking back, I think that it was both good and bad for what God wanted me to do. Okay, let me explain why. Uh, it was good because I didn't see myself as the solution to the problems, which meant that I, was, I wasn't going to rely on myself to fix what was wrong with the church. I wasn't overconfident so to speak. Right? It was good in that sense. Right? There's a humility in that way of thinking that says, I cannot do this on my own. I'm going to need some help, especially from God. And if you're thinking that way, good. Now the bad, on the other hand, is that uh, the focus that I had that gave me doubts and fears uh, was because of my lack of abilities and therefore, you know, showing a reliance on those abilities in order to make things happen. Right? In, when I heard the call and I, <laughs> and the call is real, I started looking at my abilities. I'm like, no, I can't make this happen. I can't make this happen. 
That was the bad part about that. Because that resulted in doubt and fear. Right? And some of us, oh, you are like that. Uh, you know you're being called, and you know you have abilities, but somehow you look at the, 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 the bigness of the problem, and then you look at yourself, and you're like, Duh, too much. <laughs> too much for me. And you shrink back. That's the wrong way of looking at that. Right? How, how, how are we supposed to look at a challenge that God places in front of us, knowing that we're not, <laughs> we're not capable? How are we supposed to deal with it? Look how God responds in verse 12. God said, but I will be with you. <laughs> And this shall be the sign for you. And note, note this, okay? This shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on these mountains. Let's examine that. What did God say? How do you overcome a focus on yourself? First of all, think, look, look what he said. I will be with you. Change your focus, right? That but there in the beginning of God's response tells us that God is about to say uh, something that contrasts what Moses just said. Because Moses was all about, oh Lord, I can't do this. Right? Who am I to do this? But God said, but I will be with you. Right? So Moses' mentality was all about, look at me, I can't do this, I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough. Look at God's answer. God's answer is, you're right, Moses, you're not strong enough. You're not good enough. You're not powerful enough. But I will be with you. And I am good enough, and I'm strong enough, and I will do this thing that I ask of you. All you have to do is what? Represent. Represent me. That's all you have to do. Right? So what's the sign? Remember I told you, focus on that sign. And this shall be the sign for you. What is the sign that God gave Moses to assure Moses that he is with him? Again, verse 12. This shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. What's the sign? What's the sign? It's right there, right? This shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. You're the sign. <laughs> if you go, then if you believe and you go, then that's the sign that God gives you that he has sent you. And what comes after that, I will be with you. Did you see that? The fact that God called Moses, and Moses obeyed by faith, even though he th doesn't think that he can do it, what is the sign that God will be with him and so there is nothing to fear? You guys get that? In other words, the sign of God's presence is what? Your faith in him to obey. That's the sign of God's presence. When you believe in him and you go, he's promising, he's assuring, I'm going to be with you. Right? If you believe in God and He will be faithful, or that He will be faithful and He will always be with you, if you believe that and then you obey, your faith is the sign that He will be with you. Problem is, for a lot of people, they want to see results first. Oh, yeah, God, you're going to be with me? Okay, show me. Right? That's, a lot of people, that's their problem. That's why they don't obey. That's why they don't, they don't want to obey. They're afraid to obey because they, they want to see something, right? Something objective that will say, yeah, God, God is with you. What is that? How, how is that by faith? It's not, right? If God said to me, okay, this is the sign. I'm going to get rid of all the difficult people in the church because I know you don't want to deal with them. That's the sign that I will be with you. Did that happen for me? 
No, not right away. <laughs> it happened a little bit at a time. <laughs> but, af but afterwards, it was... But, but before, when I, when I first heard the call, there was no sign. It was just either, do you believe me or not? Same with Moses, right? God's saying all these things. He's promising all these things, right? Just go to Pharaoh. Just tell him this. Tell him that. And the people will listen to you. And you'll get them out. There was no objective evidence that God was going to do that. Only if Moses believed, right? And actually did it. You guys get what I'm saying? That's what's called the step of faith. Have you seen Indiana Jones? I was watching Indiana Jones this past week. The, 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 second, the, the last Indiana Jones. Oh, no. Second last Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones and the last crusade. Have you seen that? It was Indiana Jones looking for the cup that Jesus used in the Last Supper. Have you seen that? To get to the cup, you have to go through a bunch of different obstacles. Okay? One of the obstacles is called the step of faith. And the step of faith is uh, you going into this uh, uh, cave, going through this cave, and then there's this big valley, big drop. Okay? And there's nothing in front of you, just the drop. And then uh, about, let's say, uh, let's say uh, 50 feet across is the entrance to the next cave where you can get, you can get in and find the, the cup that Jesus used. Okay? The Holy Grail, they call it. Right? So for you to cross, you either have to be able to fly or be Spider-Man, uh, you know, sling some webs. 50 feet across. Nobody can jump that. Right? It's called, the le it's called the step of faith. Why is it called the step of faith? Because there is an invisible bridge. You can't see it. The only way you're going to find out it's there is if you stepped on it. That's the step of faith. Right? And a lot of us, that's us. We're staying there. There's a problem. God's calling us to do something. Like, uh, okay, uh, pastor asked me to preach on Sunday. There's no assurance that you're going to do well. There's no assurance. You might bomb. You might, you, might be, you, know, you might be so nervous, you might not be able to speak. Okay? So there's no assurance. How do you go about preaching? How do you go about obeying? Not, not, you just take the step of faith. That's it. And once you take that step, God said what? I will be with you. A lot of us, we won't even take that, take that step. We just, no, show me the bridge first. <laughs> show me the thing first. Right? Well, how, is it, how is that faith? That's the first thing that, um, that we see here. Um, the evidence that God is with you is the fact that you went <laughs> and the faith that you had to go and obey. That's the evidence that's being shown here in Hebrews 3, er, sorry, yeah, Exodus 3. The sign that God gave Moses, right, is faith. Faith in God. That's it. Right? Do you believe? Take the step. Right? Because you know God will not fail. He's never failed. He's giving you all kinds of evidences in Scripture that he hasn't failed. You know that he's going to be faithful. He's giving you all kinds of evidences in Scripture that he's going to be faithful. So take the step. Right? I had the same problem back then. I was so afraid of the challenge that I, all I could do is focus on myself. Instead of looking to God and his faithfulness. But God said, the fact that I called you and sent you and placed you is for you a sign that I will be with you. All I had to do was trust and be convinced of that and take the step. Well, it's been almost six years since I've taken the step. And God hasn't failed me, not for one second of those six years. You take the step, you will see 
But if you don't take the step, you'll never see. You'll always wonder, will God, will God be there? Will be, God be there for me? Will God be there for me? You always ask that question. But God is saying, no, no, no. Come, take the step. I will be with you. And so, was Moses, after that, was Moses convinced? No, right? He was a stubborn guy, just like everybody else. He was so stubborn, he gave God another excuse. What's the next excuse? 13. Can you guys read that again? His next excuse? I don't know what to say. <laughs> and it's not just I don't know what to say. What if they ask me, what is your name? What do I say? <laughs> right? What if they ask me about you, God? What do I say? Again, Moses is focusing on what he is lacking. And for most of us, this is a common excuse, right? I don't know what to say. God calls you, go approach your, uh, your uh, unbelieving family. Share with them the gospel. First thing you say, what? I don't know, I don't know what to say. <laughs> right? Same thing. So uh, it's a common excuse, okay? And I've heard this excuse over and over again. Every time I ask somebody to preach, I don't know what to say, right? I don't know what to say. When it comes to evangelism, you hear it. I don't know what to say. And most of the time we say it because we don't. We don't know what to say. Or like Moses' case, if someone was to ask you a question um, about somebody that you don't know, you wouldn't know the answer, right? Right? Like, I don't know, some of you know me here, but if somebody asks you about me, about some, something intimate about me, you wouldn't know, right? Because you don't know me. Moses is the same way. I don't know what to say. But let me ask you this. If I ask you a question about your you know, favorite movie star or your favorite basketball player or your favorite baseball player, where is uh, Brother Richard's not here? If I ask you a question about them, okay, if I ask you a question like, what's your favorite basketball player's name? What's his birthday? How many points does he score? You know, some of us will <laughs> just... Rattle that off. Oh, yeah, Michael Jordan. He was born in January. <laughs> because you know that person. Right? If I ask you the same thing about your spouse, what's their favorite drink or food or hobby? Would you be able to answer those questions? <laughs> Some of us don't. We don't know our spouse. I don't know. Or you answer it and it's wrong. Right? Would you be able to answer those questions about your spouse? Right? If you answer, if you answer yes, I would be able to answer any questions about my spouse. Why? It's because you know your spouse. Like you actually know them intimately. Right? So now, think about what Moses is really saying here about God. When you say, I don't know what to say about God. What does that say about you? Right? That you don't know who God is. Right? If somebody were to ask you questions about God and you say, but I don't know. I don't know what to say. How much do you know God? Again, look at God's response to Moses' second excuse. How does God answer the excuse? God said to Moses, what? Is there much to know about God? Yes, there is. 
But is all God simple? Is simple to know who God is? Yes, it is. Go oh, simple answers. God said to Moses, "I am who I am." Say to these people, "I am sent you." <laughs> That's it. God sent me. I am has sent you. Right? Keep reading. Say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. What is the, the, the significance of that name? I am. What does that mean? You know how God says, I am Alpha, Omega, right? everlasting to everlasting is, is, is God. The significance of that name is just God exists. That's, that's all it is. He is real. He exists. And he didn't just, you know, nobody created him. He just exists. He is just there. So if somebody asks you, who's God? What are you supposed to say? How do you know he exists? That's, 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 your, that's your answer, right? That's why he gave Moses, tell them that I am the Lord, the God of your ancestors. They can, they can vouch for me, so to speak. Right? I existed even from their times. Right? A God name is I am because that's what that's who he is. He just existed. He wasn't created, and he's not going to go anywhere. He's just existing. And he's just not existing in, he's not even existing in our time. He's existing outside of time. I don't know if you believe that. That, that the God that's here right now is the same God that is going to be there 10 years from now, but he's already there. <laughs> you get know what I'm saying? Right? He's here right now, but he's already 10 years from now, he's already there. Because he just exists. He doesn't exist for a certain period of time. He just exists. That's what the I am means. And it sounds so simple to say that to somebody. And it is simple to know God. Just look around you. Right? God said, all the evidence of who I am is in creation in Romans 1. Right? But if you don't really know him, if that's all you know of him, then how are you going to answer any more questions? And how are we supposed to know him even more? What does the Bible say? He revealed himself fully in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1. Right? But before he spoke through prophets, now he speaks to his son, and that's it. He is the imprint of God. So there is a way to get to know him. Right here. It's simple, yet it's not. Right? It's like when you meet somebody. Like It's simple to just say, Hi, my name is... Simple, right? They, we know each other. Right? Me and Sister Amy, right? Sister Amy, we, knew, we know each other from last week. Hi, my name is... And your name is... Okay, I know you now. Simple. But do I really know Sister Amy? And does Sister Amy really know me? Not yet. It takes time and conversations, and right? Same with God. It's simple. I am. <laughs> but do you really know who that I am is? Moses that doesn't. He doesn't know what to say about God. Right? That's why he say, I don't... What do I say <laughs> when they ask me, what's your name is? Moses didn't know... So not only did Moses tell God, or sorry, not only did God tell Moses who he is, uh, God told Moses what to do and what he was going to do for them. And guess what? Um, and I said this last week, God speaks to us the same way today. Right? God is always revealing himself to you day in and day out through the burning bushes that we talked about last week. Always. And the problem is, just like what I said last week, the problem is we tend to just ignore. 
we ignore we ignore God when He's revealing to, revealing Himself to us through our problems. We ignore God when He's revealing Himself to us for our sicknesses. We ignore God when He's revealing Himself to us because we don't read our Bibles. Right? That's why when God calls you to preach the gospel to so and so. Or when someone approaches you and asks you a question about God, our response is almost always, what do I say? Right? Now, how is this a step of faith? Jesus, uh, in Matthew, talks about in the last days that they're going to be dragging you in front of kings. Right? And even your family members are going to drag you in front of the kings of the world back then, or in the end times. And don't worry about what you're going to say, because what? I will give you what to say when the time comes. That's a promise, right? That's a step, that's a step of faith when it comes to this excuse of Moses. What's the step of faith? Just take the step of faith, and I will give you what to say when the time comes. That happened to me in the Philippines when we went on a mission trip. We were in the hospital. Um, I think it was the, the hospital for the cancer patients, sick kids. Um, and then there was a waiting room about this big, filled with people. Mothers with their kids, dads waiting for their kids to come out of the, the doctors, filled with people, kids everywhere. And uh, the missionary who we were with, uh, Vision Isaiah, said, OK, Pastor, your turn. My turn to what? Go preach. <laughs> I'm like, what? You, you didn't tell me about this before coming here. And they just go, no, no, just go. You say something. That's how it is in the Philippines, by the way. They don't, they don't give you no you know, formal invite or, oh, by the way, you're speaking two weeks from now. Please be prepared. No, it's that day, that hour, that second. Preach something. I was tempted to say, uh, my, oh, my stomach's hurting. Uh, I need to you know, make an excuse because I don't know what to say, right? But what happened? You just take that step. I just called everybody's attention and just started talking. I didn't even know what I talked about, but I started talking. And people came, kept coming up and asking me more questions. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's all it takes sometimes for you to take that step of faith. And God will give you what he wants you to say. Right? He's going to tell you what he wants you to say. Um, because when you think about it, that excuse that Moses gave, at the root is the, of that excuse, and again, at the root of the excuse of the, the first excuse, at the root of both of those excuses is that of unbelief. You don't believe. You don't trust in God. Because if we truly believe in God, then when He calls us to do something, we trust that since He called us, He will be with us and He will equip and work through us to accomplish the task that He has called us to do. Do you believe that? Now, nobody's going to say yes now, for sure. <laughs> because if I ask you to do something, <laughs> all of a sudden, no can't do it. But do you believe that, that God is that faithful, that whatever he said to Moses in the first excuse, what is the sign that I will be with you? Is the fact that I called you and that you believe and that you obey. That's the sign. Do you believe that God is faithful to fulfill that promise to us? So if God calls you to do something, would you go? Would you do? Whatever it is that God called you to do. I don't know. <laughs> it's still that, right? It's hard. You know that illustration that a lot of pastors use as illustration, right? The Niagara Falls illustration, right? Somebody put a line or a rope across Niagara Falls. And he said, do you believe that I can cross that rope on this one-wheeled Bicycle, or not bicycle, it's one wheeled. It's a unicycle, okay? One wheeled unicycle 
crossing the rope over Niagara Falls. Do you believe that I can cross it? Everybody say, yes, we trust in you. All right, whoever said the loudest, come ride on my back. And we will cross it together. <laughs> and the guy who obviously, no, no, you go by yourself. I'm not going to go with you. That's us, right? Every time we hear, yeah. Jesus can do this. Yes, Jesus can do that. He can save everybody. Yes. And then God calls you, okay, go preach Jesus to your brother. Or go preach Jesus to the person you're sitting next to on the train right now. What do you do? I don't know. It's embarrassing. I don't know this person. All kinds of excuses. Come on. Number one is, I don't know what to say. Hmm. At the root of all these excuses is unbelief. Because if we are so confident in God, and so we believe in God, we will obey. And we will not just obey with, just, you know, uh, you know begrudgingly obey. We will obey with confidence and with joy. Right? So when God calls you to preach or teach or evangelize or go to missions, whatever it is, do so with confidence and joy. Because at that point, when you take that step of faith and obey, what you're really saying is that I know that God truly exists. I believe in Him. That He is there with me. That He will never leave me. That He will never forsake me. And you will just talk about Him like you've been friends for years. Because God will give you what to say at that point. I don't think. You guys convinced about that? <laughs> this is probably the hardest sermon that I have to preach. Because I can't, I can't, I can't convince you, right, that God, God will do that. I don't care how many stories I tell up here, I can't convince you that God will. But hopefully, God will convince you that He will. And when that time comes that He calls, we will all respond the same way. Amen? <sighs> hmm. So both of those excuses are rooted in unbelief. That's why both of God's answers to Moses, if you notice, um, was a focus on who God is. You notice that when God answered Moses, when he gave him his excuses, he didn't encourage Moses by saying, it's okay, you can do it. <laughs> he didn't say that. Uh, God didn't say, you know, I didn't call you because you were not qualified. You're qualified. That's why I called you. He didn't encourage him that way. Right? Or he didn't say, it's okay, Moses, I know you're the man for the job. didn't say that. God didn't do that. Instead, God says what? Look at me. Right? Focus on me. Tell them about me. Right? That's what God's res response was. Not an encouraging, you know, oh, come Moses, it's okay. You can do it. Look at me. That's what God said. Uh, Riken comments, the call to God's service always comes with the promise of God's presence. Let me say that again. The call to God's service always comes with the promise of God's presence. Amen? Now, the question is, the only thing rem question remaining is, what do you trust God? Because you... God's presence, what's, what's God's presence? Can you see it? Is there anything that you're holding that you, does this, does this bring God's presence? No. Right? It's the Holy Spirit in us that tells us, yep, God's with you. Yep, God's with you. Don't worry, keep going. God's with you. Keep going, keep going. Question is, do you trust God? If you say you do, then there is no excuse for unbelief. That's the title of the ser sermon. No excuse for unbelief. Why? 
Because God has proven himself over and over again. He's going to be faithful. So what, what's stopping you? <laughs> right? No excuse for unbelief. And therefore, no excuse for saying no or ignoring God's call. Okay? We need to realize that God's call for us to serve him is also a promise that he will be with us every step of the way. And again, the question is, do you believe that? The sign that God gives us that this is true is the faith to believe in his promise to be faithful no matter what. That's why, again, I ask you the question, do you trust God? If you do, whatever it is that he's calling you to do, do it by faith. No matter how hard or how impossible it may seem or how you feel so inadequate for the task, the fact that God called you to do it means that he will be faithful to work through you in order to accomplish the task that he has called you to do. Do you believe that? I hope so. I hope so. Some of you are going to get called. All of us will at one point. So it's just a matter of what? Taking that step of faith and trusting that God will be with you each and every step of the way. Amen? Let's pray. The Lord.